menina Eretea, pelea de Orgileos, nai. Hello there, I'm Simon, welcome to my channel. Today's topic is once again the Pantheon. In episode 2 of what is now probably gonna be a series, I'm gonna share with you 12 more deities from Greek mythology that you probably did not know existed. I mean, unless you've read Percy Jackson. There's a couple that appeared in Heroes of Olympus, so if you've read that, you should know them. But most of them, I'm fairly confident about that you've never heard of them. Does that sentence make sense? I don't know, you know what I mean. So, in no particular order, here are 12 more Greek deities that only genius classicists have ever heard of. The first one of the day is a goddess by the name of Ananke. She is one of the primordial deities, meaning she stems from a time when the Pantheon was a little more concepts personified and just a little bit less characters in a sitcom. They are basically the first generation of deities, meaning they kind of just appeared at the beginning of everything, alongside Gaia and those other peeps. Now, at that point, they were still incorporeal, meaning that the humanoid body they take is really just a representation of the more abstract, metaphysical reality that they are. Make sense? Anyway, Ananke is the goddess of necessity, compulsion and inevitability, which I'm not gonna go into, because there's a whole philosophical and literary discussion to be had about what to believe that actually means. Feel free to have that in the comments though. She is normally depicted as a lady with wings carrying a torch. According to Plato, she is the mother of the Moirai, aka Cloto, Lachesis and Atropos, the goddesses of fate, who are responsible for making the thread of life, which does make sense, since she is basically also in charge of fate. Her husband is a guy called Kronos, the primordial god of time. And it's important to note that this is not in fact the same Kronos who fathered and ate the Olympians. No, that Kronos was a titan and a bleep. The titans were Gaia's kids, while this guy was more of a brother to her. However, the two were probably merged into one figure over time, which makes sense. They basically have the same name. Moving on to number two. Let's talk about Bia, which is probably the shortest name from the Greek pantheon I've ever seen. And it kinda sounds like an acronym of some super secret agency. Anyway, before they come after me for figuring that out, let's talk about the Greek Daimon. She is a personification of force. And I'm not talking about midichlorians, because no one ever does. I'm actually talking about, like, physical strength. Muscles, I guess. I'm not sure what exactly the difference is between this and what Kratos does, but I'm sure there's an important distinction to be made. Kratos is also her brother, by the way. Have I mentioned that? Which means that she is also a kid of Pallas and Styx. Number 3. Ritomartis is a virgin goddess of nets. So she is basically a very specific version of Artemis. I think Arty just wanted to get her BFF a spot in the Pantheon. She used to live on the Isle of Crete, where she was actually a huntress. That is, until King Minos felt entitled to pursue her. Well, she didn't really like that and made a run for it. And unlike Daedalus, she did not consider the waves any kind of obstacle and kinda just jumped into the sea. That's how badly she wanted to get away from that creep. Oh, if you don't know what Daedalus has to do with any of this, read Ovidius. By the island of Aegina, she got stuck in the nets of some fishermen. So it makes sense to make her the goddess of nets, I guess. Now, historically, it seems she was already a hunting goddess on Crete before Artemis even got there. So when they met, they probably mixed some of her characteristics with Artie, but wanted to keep her as well, 
so they gave her a weirdly specific job. Her name is derived from the Cretan word Britu, which means sweet, and the Assyrian word Martu, which I'm probably mispronouncing, and which means girl. Number four is Harmonia. Guess what she is the goddess of? She is the goddess of harmony and balance. Duh. Which means she is responsible for the harmonious actions of soldiers in war, but also harmony between married people. Which is no coincidence, since she's the daughter of Ares and Aphrodite, you know, the goddess of love, and her husband's brother. But that does mean that it makes a lot of sense that she would be all about love and positive connection, Aphrodite's forte, in a context of conflict, which is Ares' whole deal. She was given the hand of a guy called Cadmus, who founded Thebes. Unfortunately for her, she was a fruit of the adultery of Hephaestus' wife, and Greek deities know how to hold a grudge. So he gave her a cursed necklace for a wedding gift. Anyway, they had to leave Thebes and eventually Caddy became the king of the Illyrians. And then they were transformed into dragons and they went to Elysium. Which is kind of dope actually. 5. The Cabeiroi. Now you may consider these guys a bit of a cheat because there's two of them. Bringing the total count for this episode to 13, but well, I'm gonna count them as one entity, because it's my channel. Anyway, these guys are twins, because of course they are. And they are Daimonis, who had to do with the mystery cult on Samothrake. In fact, they were in charge of the orchiastic dances, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Weirdly, they have nothing to do with Dionysus. These mysteries were actually honoring Demeter, her daughter Persephone, and Hecate. Anyway, these guys don't seem to actually have names for themselves. They're always just named as the Cabeiroi, one unit. And I'm just gonna say this, being half of a set of twins. Do not do this. There is nothing more annoying for a twin than being considered half of a set. They're their own person. At least give them their own names. Actually, let's give them names. From now on, the left one shall be called Leonidas. And the right one shall be Alexandros. Deal? Deal. Anyway, these guys are considered to be dwarves. And since their dad was Hephaestus, they helped out at his forgery at Lemnos. Which might actually have something to do with why dwarves in the fantasy genre are considered to be master smiths. Their mom was a sea goddess called Cabeiro, which is why they're called the Cabeiroi. As usual, it's not very creative, but it does the job. We're halfway now. Next up is someone you'll probably remember if you've read Heroes of Olympus. Her name is Hione, and she is the goddess of snow, which is kind of surprising. Like, do the Greeks ever even get snow? How do they even know that it exists? Is this proof of some kind of ancient climate change? Anyway, however they may have known about it, they had a goddess for it. And her name was Hione. She is the daughter of Boreas, god of the northern wind. Who, by the way, also has a consort who is also called Hione. Which is confusing at best. And kinda nasty at worst. She actually had a son with Poseidon, who was called Aumolpos. And in order to keep the kid hidden from her dad, she threw him into the sea, where he was saved by his dad. Number 7 is a lady called Chloris. She was a nymph who became the goddess of the flowers. She actually married one of the other wind deities, Zephyros god of the western winds. Their kid was a guy called Karpos, who became god of fruit. Oh hey, again, two for the price of one. So that makes 14 already. Oh well. Anyway, apparently he was in love with a guy called Kalamos, and at some point the two had a swimming competition, 
which actually killed Karpos. So then, out of grief, Kalamos drowned himself and subsequently transformed into a reed. Not sure why. I don't actually think there really is a real reason. Now, unfortunately, there's not a lot to be said about number 8, which may actually be a good thing, because this is gonna be a long video as it is. So yeah, this guy's name is Chrysos, and if you know a bit of Greek, you may know that that is quite literally the word for gold. So guess what he's the god of? Right, he is a personification of gold and richness. And like about 90% of everyone in Greek mythology, he's a kid of Zeus. Because what else would he be? Enea is a cool dude, who we also, unfortunately, don't know a lot about. His name is Koalemos, and he does not, in fact, have anything to do with koalas. Though I wouldn't be too surprised if someone gave him that name by mistake. Because that's what he's the god of. I mean, not misnomers, but of stupidity in general. He's like the personification of that tarot card. The one they didn't even bother giving a number. He's thought to be a son of Nux, but there doesn't actually seem to be a source for that, so I'm not sure where that actually comes from. His name is derived from the words akuo, which means to hear, and elios, which means foolishness. I'm starting to lose count, but the next one is someone called Komos. Now, this guy is the god of merriment and festivity, so it probably won't surprise you to hear that I like this one. <laughs> now, he is the son of a god called Dionysus, which, given his job, probably doesn't surprise anyone. And because Dio is such a good dad, he gave the lad a job as his cup bearer, because you need a guy to carry that thing for you. I don't know how I've been surviving without one. As to what he actually looks like, well, reports vary. Some say he looks like a sort of satyr-like figure. Others say he looks like a winged figure. So I guess we should hope we never have to put him on a wanted poster, because that could go way wrong. The penultimate one on this list is one that the readers of Heroes of Olympus will probably remember as well. It's also an important one for this series because it was in fact the scene where she appeared that inspired me to even do this. So I kind of had to include her. If you don't know what the Hades I'm talking about, all I can say is read Heroes of Olympus. Anyway, number 10 is of course the famous Kumopoleia. She was a daughter of Poseidon and Amphitrite, which makes her sister of both Triton and Percy Jackson, and an aunt to Ariel, actually. She was married to the Hecaton Geras Briarios, who made huge storms with his arms, which she was the goddess of. Talk about relationship goals. Her name of course means waves resident, or something. Kuma means waves, and Boleo means something like to live in, so make of that what you will. And the last one for this episode is someone called Scamandos. Now, you may think this is like the god of monsters or fantastical creatures, but no, this guy comes from a completely different bestseller, namely the Iliad. Now, that poem is all about the Trojan War and all the stuff Achilles gets up to during said war. And one of the things he does is attacking a river, because he's Achilles and he gets to fight rivers if he wants to. I mean, it's not quite that ridiculous. Actually, the river in question was ruled by the god Scamandos, who was friendly to the Trojans, which makes sense. I mean, he's a local, so yeah. And so, he tried to drown Achilles, and he probably would have succeeded, since he's literally an entire river, if it wasn't for Hephaestus, who used his fire god magic to drive him back. And that's 12. So I guess it's about time to wrap this up, huh? Time for the YouTube thing. So you know the drill. Let me know down below what you think of these deities and which one is your favorite. Also, 
What do you think about making this a series? Do you want to see more of these deities? Because I'm pretty sure there's like a thousand more. If you have any suggestions for deities I could cover in the future, feel free to also leave them below. And of course, if you have any extra factoids to share about any of these deities, feel free to also do so below. If you liked this video, you can click that like button, or if you didn't, you can click the dislike button. If you like this stuff, please consider checking out my channel, where you can find a lot more nerdiness. And if it appeals to you, maybe you can subscribe. If you do, don't forget to ring the bell as well, because apparently that's important to YouTube. And of course, you can share this video all over the internet. Surely you know one of those mythology addicts who would love to see this. And of course, you can find my sources and my socials down below. Eucharisteo pu paraculo te